Good morning, church. Welcome to the 51st year of Carmichael Church. Yeah, we do, we're talking about in staff meet or in our in our pre-worship meeting. I go, wow, this, we're we're starting a new era here. It's pretty exciting. So, welcome, Merry Christmas. It's good to have you here, all here on this Christmas post-Christmas Sabbath. I don't know what do you call after Christmas? Like it's not Christmas Eve anymore, but Merry Christmas, Happy. Happy holidays to everybody here, and uh, we're just so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. There aren't a ton of announcements going on right now. It is kind of a, the, the, the vacation season. I want to welcome those college students that are home uh, here uh, as well, and it's good to have you home. Uh, this week, I want to remind you, this week and next week, uh, because of the holidays and the families in town, we don't have potluck this week or next week. Uh, so hopefully you weren't planning on that today, uh, but it is no potluck this week or next week as well. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that. We do have some exciting things happening in the new year, though, that we want to uh, keep keep you appraised of. One of them is in your bulletin right here. Uh, you can see this red flyer in the bulletin. We are going to be continuing. We have a weekend series that we like to do three to four times a year. And our weekend series for the, for the fall is with uh, Dr. Tim, Je- Tim Jennings. And that's going to start on January 8 at 7 p.m. Okay, and the information is in your bulletin. And he's going to be pre- presenting here for the entire weekend uh, of January 7 and 8. Okay, so there, there's information in your bulletin. This is something that you definitely will want to come to uh, or even invite some friends to as well. Bobby, we have some stuff going on with our offering, so uh, tell us a little bit what's going on with our offering call today, and there's a special envelope in the bulletin as well. Good morning. Okay, I've got some papers to work with here, so I'm going to put these down. So first of all, I've got some great news. So last, over the last couple of weeks... We've been very careful to print this box in your bulletins, right, of what our family church budget need is for the end of the year. Well, here's the good news. How many have already looked at the box this week in the red? You taking a look at it? The number there is, what does it say? 50,000 to finish off this year. And because we've already been planning, our pastors, uh, Dick Clark and our finance committee, we know to start next year with a balanced budget, the number was 50000 Well, Dick was in his office, so this printed about Tuesday, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday. Dick was kind enough on Thursday to run into the office and give me the numbers. And that 50000 because of our church's dedication and our family commitment, family's commitment to, to our church budget, that 50000 is now $37,000. Um, 37000 to finish off... Um, a balanced budget for this year, and to get us started for the net for 2016 with a strong balanced budget. So is that is that an amen? That number keeps coming down, and we are getting closer. And I want to thank you all. Um, last week we celebrated the wonderful start to our church, and I think today and every Sabbath we can continue to celebrate the ongoing work and the commitment of each of you and each of our families. Um, as we continue to, um, to provide uh, for God's house and God's ministry. Um, going forward, you also see a special envelope in your, in your bulletin. Um, this year, we're going to rec- recommit. Is that, a, is that the appropriate word, Benji? Um, to missions, both near and far. And so there's going to be a special, um, the loose offerings um, this Sabbath will be for local church budget. And there's also this envelope. Um, if you want to start giving, start seeding, if you will, uh, for our special, uh, for some mission trips and some special mission work both near and far. Thank you again for your giving um, as we come to the end of, of our calendar year. Thank you, Bobby. So again, uh, we are, as a staff, um, looking at, we haven't done, it's been a while since we did a mission trip. And it's something that uh, we are excited about planning for in this next year. And so that's what our special Christmas offering is for this year as we start planning ahead for that. 
Uh, the last thing I want to point out in your bulletins is this Connect card. Each week we do bring this out. I want to remind you that if you're a visitor here today, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, prayer requests or special prayer requests that are happening in your life and your family uh, at, our, at our staff meetings each week. We take a look at these Connect cards and have special prayer for those. Uh, or if you'd like a pastoral visit, uh, also during Pastor Caleb's sermon, uh, he's going to be pointing out some of these things that we'd like you to make sure that this worship experience isn't just an hour of your life, but something that hopefully is transformative for the rest of your week. And there's some perhaps some, some helpful next steps for you as well. If you'd like to maybe think about becoming a member here, there's also you can form, fill out the front of this card, or if you'd like to transfer your membership from another church, that's how you would do that. As we, as we continue our worship service this morning, I'd invite you to, to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Do you know, Father God, I just again want to invite you into our hearts. Uh, your presence is here. You've promised that when we gather together. So, God, as we worship today through song, through fellowship, through celebrating, through maybe even some of the challenges of our lives, God, if, as we bring those all to you this morning, we ask you to fill our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning, church. Hope you all had a very merry Christmas yesterday. It's the day after Christmas, but we still have Christmas in our hearts here on the stage. And want to bring that to you this morning. Hope you enjoy singing these Christmas songs with us, starting with Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King.
good. Morning. Hey, man. How you doing? Okay. All right. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This is a new Christmas song. When Pastor uh, Keith asked me to do a special, he says, you know, think of maybe creating something. Uh, And so it's kind of scary trying to write a Christmas song. But this one is titled, Through the Valley. It came on a midnight clear Unto us a child is born And angels did appear Hark the herald, hear the cry See the star in the sky O little town of Bethlehem The babe that you cradle must die Jesus came. 
came to dwell Emmanuel Jesus came to dwell Emmanuel It's time for children's story, so don't forget to go all the way back to the back of the church, grab those dollar bills for that lamb's offering, and come on down for the children's story and have a seat on these steps. Boys and girls, good morning. The story today comes from uh, a very, very small village which is found in the eastern part of Africa, called, a country called Kenya. And in that, in that small village, about 80 years ago, people used to be governed by people called chiefs. Have you heard of a chief? Chiefs, it's like a king, but a chief presides over a very small tribe instead of a country. So in England, they have a king, but in most of the parts of Africa, which were colonized by the British, they have chiefs. So in this small tribe called Kisi, there was a chief called Senior Chief Nya. We're going to call him Senior Chief Nya. The name is long, so I'm going to spare you the pain of having to spell it, to pronounce it. And he, has, he had a son he loved so much, and his son was Nyach. So we have the king, senior chief called Nya, and we have a son called Nyach. So when, um, when Nyach was about 10 years old, there was always fighting between the Kisi, this small tribe called Kisi and the Maasai. Some of you have heard of the Maasai. The Maasai are nomads. Nomads are people who go from places to places and have cows. They don't have really land of their own, so they go from places to places looking for water and, and grass for their, you know, for their animals. So there was always fighting between the Masa and the Kisi because the Masa had no land, the Kisi had land, and the Masa were always coming to the Kisi land, stealing cows and going through all their stuff. So there was always fighting. 
And one, one day the master ambushed the Kisi at night. And they got to the area where the senior chief Nya lived with his love, uh, what, this one son he loved called Nya. And guess what happened? They wanted to take their life, but the chief begged with the master, please don't kill my son, please, this is my loving son, don't kill him. So the master said, okay, we're going to take you, but we're going to leave the son. And Chief Nya said, before you take my son, before you, you take my life, I'm going to talk to my son. And this is what he said to his son. Son, I may not see you again, but whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you say, remember you are the son of the chief. So every single day, Nyach woke up, he reminded himself that he was the son of the chief. So he became, he went to school, he did very well in elementary school, in high school, he was a top student in his school. And he was very helpful to the other students, he was always helping other people. And even was in sports, he played what they call rugby, equivalent to football, but better, rugby. <laughs> So, so, so when one time the newspaper of the school did an editorial to find out why, what made Nyach, Nyach, because everybody loved Nyach. He was very nice to everybody, worked very hard, he played rugby. He was the best, the exemplary student in the school. And this is what he told them. Before my dad died, he told me whatever I do, wherever I go, whatever I say, I'm the son of the chief. And every day I woke up, and every time I went to bed, I reminded myself I was the son of the chief. And that is what shaped my life. Because I always knew I was the son of the chief. You know what, boys and girls? You are more than sons and daughters of a chief. Do you know that? You are sons of, who can tell me you are sons of who? Can you tell me? God. Very good. You are sons of somebody who is more than a tribal chief, somebody who is more than a tribal king, somebody who is more than a British colony king. You are the sons and daughters of God. So remember every time you wake up, every time you go to bed, and in anything you do, what you say, and what you, wherever you are, remember that you are sons and daughters of God. And that will shape your lives. Thank you very much. Okay, you may go to your seats. This morning we have the Martin family here and we're going to be dedicating their two babies. This is Liz and Peyton and their twin babies, Patrick and Violet. And this is their dedication. And I don't know about you guys, but as a mom, as a mother of twins, one of the phrases that I hear just about every time I step out of my house is, wow, you sure have your hands full. Oh my goodness. Your hands, oh, you have your hands full. Looks like you've got your hands, and you, do you guys, do you guys hear this sometimes? You, you get this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, right now I'm oh, trying to okay. fix the socks so it doesn't fall off with the camera. <laughs> do you have any favorite responses to this phrase? Oh, you have, it looks like you have your hands full. Yeah, 
So is our heart. So is our heart. <laughs> well, I have wrestled with this. This, uh, what do I say? What's the correct thing to say to someone? You sure have got your hands full. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I do. I and I. I mean, it, we do. We're we're overwhelmed. Two babies at the same time. Two babies at the same time. I mean, even the Bible when uh, they talk about a man with lots of children. And they refer it to like a quiver full of arrows. And so even the Bible is like this picture of your hands full, like all these arrows shaking around in this quiver. And so I wrestled with like, wow, oh, what do I say to this? And and I think sometimes I have, you know, doubted myself. Like, why did, why did God give me twins, right? Like, why did he pick me? I don't, I'm not that great of a mom. Or am I supposed to handle this? Am I, am I going to do a good job? Am I going to do this well? And so... One of the things I take great comfort in uh, is a verse in the Psalms. It's Psalms 139, my favorite psalm, and it says, I knit you together. I was knit together in my mother's womb. The Lord is speaking. I knit you together in your mother's womb. And the psalmist responds, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then he says, all of the days of my life were written in your book before even one of them came to be. And I like that because... It's like God saw the, the, what, this chaos that we would have, this crazy, you know, all the, the hands full moments. He saw it, and it's all been written in his book. It's all been planned and prepared for. So when we bring our babies to dedicate them to God, as you guys are doing today, um, we're giving God permission to work out those plans that he has for our babies. We're, let, we're saying to him, what are we saying? Are you saying something? <laughs> We're saying um, whatever you knit them together for, whatever your purpose for them was, we want you to accomplish that in their life. And I know something that Liz shared with me, uh, she shared, she said that the story of Hannah has always meant a lot to her. Hannah, this woman who, who tried and who struggled and who, who could not get pregnant, and Liz identifies with this experience very much. And Hannah tells the Lord, if you would just, if you would just give me a baby, I will give him back to you and she gets that baby and we and her story ends with her singing uh, where her story doesn't end but when the baby comes she's she tells the lord um, for this child i prayed and you have granted my request and so this is what the martin family wanted to do today is is to make a gesture we're giving our babies back to the lord um, because we asked for them and he blessed us with them so that's what we're going to do. We're going to dedicate you guys, give you to Jesus. Ask him to work out his plans for your life. All the plans that he has that we don't even see yet. And we're also dedicating you guys as parents. Um, so no pressure. Now you have to be perfect from this moment out. <laughs> no, but what it really means that. is... Yeah, you got it. You're good. <laughs> means is um, it's a time to also to give yourself to the Lord and say I will try to raise these babies to follow your ways to the best of my ability and um, James tells us that if anyone lacks wisdom he should ask God who gives freely to all so anytime you're feeling like oh, my hands are so full I don't know what to do you ask for that wisdom anytime any moment any day and uh, we're going to ask the Lord that your hands will be full of the right things, that your hands would be full of wisdom, that your hands would be full of joy, that your hands would be full of memories and blessings and happiness and safety and a beautiful future together. So that's what we're going to pray for today as we dedicate these babies. Pretty cute, huh? So as you heard, this is Payton and Liz. And their son, or son and daughter, Patrick and Violet. And I want to, can we get the rest of the family? Um, I understand you have some family here. Would you guys like to join us up here? Feel free to point people out and just motion them up. <laughs> yeah, come on up. Because we really want to um, just take this time for, with your family as well as our church family, um, to dedicate. Uh, them to God. You know, say, God, we want your purposes uh, for Patrick and Liz. We, we want you to be working in Violet's life, and we want your plans to happen for them. So, all right, this guy's already got a hold of me on one side. Here you go. You know, double duty? Here we yes. go. <laughs> all right. Okay. 
That's right, twinning. Okay. Oh. <laughs> now if they don't cry, now they won't be able to really get excited. All right, church family, let's pray together. God, we're so thankful uh, for the gift of children. And as we're holding um, Violet and Patrick here, God, we, we want your plans to come to pass for them. You know, in the same way that Hannah uh, said, I want this son uh, to be the Lord's. God, I just thank you that Peyton and, Peyton and Liz has, have said today, we want our kids to be yours, Jesus. Um, so Lord, I pray for, for this family, and God, I also pray for us here at the Carmichael Church. And God, give us wisdom and help us know uh, when to encourage, uh, when to pray for them, because we really do want to see them grow up uh, into your family, Jesus. Uh, so we thank you, God, and we just give you so much glory for, for blessing us, <laughs> for blessing us with Violet and Patrick's life. Thank you, God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll take Yeah. Thank you. Can you just give them some applause?
Silent night, holy night. What a blessed time that must have been. Father, we just thank you uh, for sending your son as a tiny baby um, to come and be God with us. And we just thank you for that precious promise that you gave us. And Father, we just thank you for this season and we take time to pause and reflect on the gift that you gave us. And Father, you came to forgive us of our sins and we just ask that for you, from you today, that you would just um, grant us that forgiveness, that we might just be holy in your sight. And Father, we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us um, in this place today and just to um, guide our thoughts and our actions and to just open our hearts and our minds as Pastor Caleb brings us your word today. And Father, we have so many blessings um, to be thankful for, but we also know there are many prayer requests amongst us in this room today. So I just want to take a moment to pause and allow those of us that are here to just um, send those up to you. Father, I just want to pray for Pastor Caleb today as he brings your message to us. Uh, may the words that he speaks be yours um, and not his. And may you just anoint his lips and his tongue um, to speak your words. And Father, we just thank you that as we um, wrap up 2015, that we might just reflect on the many blessings that you've given us um, and that you would help us to just enter into this new year as we seek a relationship with you. And we also look forward to your soon return. Uh, may you just come quickly. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. There is born. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. For those of you who are visiting family and friends, uh, welcome to the Carmichael SDA Church. My name is Caleb Henry, and I am pastor of discipleship and outreach here. Um, I'm the youngest, so I won't be up youngest pastor here, so I won't be upset if you call me the youth pastor, uh, but I'm actually not. Uh, it's confusing to many I know. Um, today, uh, I love this time of year because, first of all, um, it's Christmas and we get to have an excuse to watch Christmas movies together, uh, spend time with friends and family. And also, I like it because it's uh, the Sabbath in between Christmas and the new year, uh, where we're thinking about, okay, God, what's happened this past year and what do you have for us in the future? Um, so this is one of my favorite Sabbaths, so I'm glad I get to speak um, here during it. As Ed Dower read for our uh, scripture this morning, I'm going to be focusing on the angel's message to the shepherds, uh, but I'm kind of going to use it as a jumping off point for what is this good news they're talking about, and how is it possible that it's good news for everyone? Um, you know, for those of us who, who watch the news, um, very rarely do you hear something that you could say everybody's excited about. Um, so how is this good news different? How is it something that's good for everybody? As it says in Luke 2.10, And the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Now this word, um, good news, is in the Greek, it's euangelion. Um, it's from that that word, and it means good news. Uh, this is where we get our word gospel from. Um, it's also in the New Testament. They sometimes translate it as preaching, uh, proclaiming, bringing, told, announcing. All these things um, come from the same word that means good news. Um, so, like when we talk about evangelizing, what that was originally meant to be was telling people uh, about this good news. And you see it used uh, throughout the New Testament. It's used here to make this announcement about um, who Jesus was. Uh, then it, 
Later on, Jesus used it, uses it in Luke 4, 43. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So Jesus is saying, I was sent here to proclaim this good news um, throughout Israel. Then, uh, later in Acts, uh, Paul is, is talking about Paul, and it says, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is, again, that same word. Um, that God has called us to share this good news with the people over here in Macedonia. Now, um, I'm going to apologize to you. This should be a uh, sermon series, um, but I'm taking next week off. <laughs> so, it's just one sermon. So, I'm gonna, this is, so, this is a jump I'm making that I probably should explain more. But I'm going to uh, kind of summarize these things, this good news, as this good news is that a new king is coming to take charge who will save you. So, when the angels tell the shepherds, uh, Today a Savior is coming, who is Christ the Lord. Uh, they, they interpreted that as, there's this King coming, and He's going to save us. Now, this is a hard thing for people, because uh, if you heard that a King was coming, a new King was coming, who's making a new kingdom, and He's going to save you, up until this point, that had always meant war, right? Right? And so, Jesus is kind of fighting against this idea that just because he's coming as king, just because he's bringing a new kingdom, a kingdom of God, does that mean that now Israel's finally going to rise up and kill their enemies? You know, like we kind of think of, uh, you know, I'm sure during the holidays you had different discussions uh, around the family circle about how... Um, how is this new king going to come? Well, for Israel, um, that, that was the thing they focused on. They knew that a new king was coming. They knew that God was going to come and make all things right, but they weren't sure how this was going to happen. And so, this good news is proclaiming what we had been hoping was going to happen, that's now happening. So, this king uh, that we've been hoping for all these years, now he has come. And so that's what they're talking about. But uh, part of the reason I wanted to talk about the subject today is because I think for many of us, this joy uh, of sharing good news has become less exciting. And I think it's because we've kind of switched uh, from good news to good advice in what we proclaim. Uh, N.T. Wright, in his book, Simply Good News, has this quote that I think really speaks to this. It says, in many churches, the good news has subtly changed into good advice. Here's how to live, they say. Here's how to pray. Here are techniques for helping you become a better Christian, a better person, a better husband or wife. And in particular, here's how to make sure you're on the right track for what happens after death. Take this advice, say this prayer, and you'll be saved. You won't go to hell, you'll go to heaven. Here's how to do it. This is advice, not news. And I think that this can be awkward uh, because for many of us, um, we've experienced getting unwanted advice. And, and so we're hesitant to want to do that to others. You know, I, I'm sure for... Uh, for parents, you know, we just talked about um, this morning, Melissa shared about having twins and how that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a load. It's, it's an exciting journey, um, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of crazy at times as well. And I'm not going to ask uh, them to come up and share, but I'm sure that for those of you who are parents, at one time or another, somebody's come up to you and said, uh, I have some good advice for you. Um, I, I read this article on Twitter uh, and, and it made things really simple on how to parent. Let me share this with you. You should do this. Uh, and I'm sure that's even easier to receive if it comes from somebody like me who's not a parent. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, that parenting thing, I, it's okay. I've read two articles on it. I've got it down. You're set. You'll be fine. 
Or for those of you who aren't parents, um, or maybe in high school, maybe you've had the privilege of having somebody uh, come up to you after a basketball game or a sports thing and just and give you some advice. This person has been sitting on the sidelines watching you play. Um, they, they were maybe really good like 20 or 30 years ago. <laughs> and, and they say, you know, I think, I think you'd be a really good player. You should just start boxing out. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's... And to do that better, this is what you should do. You should make this change, and then this change, and then this change. And we've all experienced um, getting unasked for advice. Um, So if somebody isn't asking us what to do in a situation, it's easy for us to say, well, I don't want to give them unwanted advice, so I'm not going to share, I'm not going to evangelize. And what's interesting to me is that Jesus doesn't do this. Because there are many times where he could have given good advice that was true, but he does something else instead. You know, I think one of the, one of the great uh, examples of this is the woman at the well. He could have come up to her and said, uh, you know, we, we don't know her name, um, but for the sake of this story, I'm going to say Sarah, okay? So he could have said, you know, Sarah, um, I know you're struggling with some things, uh, you're, right now, you're sleeping with somebody that isn't your husband. You should stop that. Um, you should not do those things that you're currently doing. May you be blessed. Goodbye. Uh, and he, he says something that's, um, that's uh, an action they should take. And I, I wanted to defi- define advice as news plus the word should. So I have this news, I have this, um, these things that, that I know about how to live, and I'm going to add the word should to it, and then you're welcome. <laughs> uh, you know, this might come out as you should, um, for those of you who are in high school, maybe you experienced this, you should wear something different than that. Um, <laughs> you should uh, bake with this instead of this. Um, you should not eat that kind of cheese, uh, wh- whatever the case may be. Um, but Jesus, uh, he comes to this place and with the one with the well, instead of saying, you should stop doing this, you should do this instead, he just says, uh, he starts talking about water. Basically, uh, is what you're doing satisfying? Is that, is that meeting your needs? Is that fulfilling you, because if it's not, I want to give you news about a new opportunity. You can come to me, and I, I give people water that never stops. It just keeps on going. It's like a spring is just flowing from you with living water. And so Jesus comes into people's situation and lets them know that there's a new option available because of him. There is this news that Jesus has come And he's come in such a way that new options are available for life because he's come. Now, so to summarize, this news is that a new king is coming to take charge who will save you. Now, the problem is, how is this good news for everyone? You know, for for the Israelites, they've experienced new kings coming. Uh, Recently, there's been a civil war uh, in Rome, and so there's been fighting, and new kings are trying to come, trying to depose the old king, um, and eventually um, Octavian, whose name changed into Augustus, he wins, and so this good news is sent out that now there's this new king, uh, King, uh, Emperor Augustus, who's going to be in charge of Rome, and he's going to bring peace. This is good news. And it's that same word, um, euangelion. And so people have heard about new kings coming, but usually it's good news for one side, the winning side, and it's bad news for everybody who loses. (laughs) So for every battle, uh, the idea that somebody new is coming is going to be good for some people, but it's going to be very bad for the people that don't have as big guns. You know, you've experienced this uh, watching the news. So people can say as much as they want, everybody's going to benefit from me being in charge 
because I have great plans and I'm really smart. But some people, usually the people who are currently in charge, it's not going to be good news for them. And so I want to look at how does Jesus coming as king, how is that good news for everybody? Now, like we mentioned before, how this good news of a new king was going to happen uh, was something that Israel talked about. People had ideas of how this was going to happen, but nobody was sure exactly what was going to come to pass. There were three primary ideas, though, that were kind of at the forefront. The first was that this good news of a new king would happen because the Messiah would lead the Israelites to destroy their enemies. So God is going to anoint a new king um, like he did with David, and then that person is going to somehow, uh, God is going to bless them, and then they're going to lead is the Israelites, and they're going to take over the Romans. So this was something that some people in Israel felt. Uh, for one group would be the Zealots. You've heard of Simon the Zealot was one of Jesus' followers. This was somebody who felt like God was going to bless their armies and they were going to rise up and take over the other kingdoms. They were going to destroy their enemies. Now, another idea was that God was forcefully coming to judge other nations. So this was, you know, it's not going to be because we're fighting really well. One day, God is going to come and he's going to take out all these people who have been hurting us. All these people, the Romans who have been uh, forcing us to do these different things, the enemy nations, God is going to come back. He's going to judge the other nations. They're going to be destroyed, and then we'll be able to go on together. Um, so there was this idea that it wasn't going to come by God anointing a leader it or working through humans. It was just going to come, God was just going to come forcefully and destroy everyone else. Now, finally, there was this third idea that God was going to send a Messiah or prophet or spiritual leader to get the people ready, and then, co- co- then God comes and forcefully destroys the other nations. So uh, God is going to wait until the Israelites are su- sufficiently holy or ready for him to come, and then he's going to come and destroy everyone else. Now, the Pharisees uh, primarily thought this was what was going to happen. So that's why they were so upset by Jesus accepting sin, because they felt like they had to get rid of the sin, and then God would come and destroy their enemies. But this is actually something that Jesus, throughout his ministry, is fighting against. Because anybody, anytime somebody hears, this is the Messiah, this is the one who God has sent, they automatically think, okay, let's get ready because God is going to use him to destroy our enemies. You know, that's, that's why, uh, for me personally, I think that's why Jesus talked so often about the Son of Man um, instead of the Messiah, or instead of saying he's the Son of God. He makes up this new term because people already think they know what being the Messiah means. I don't know if you've, already, you've tried to have a conversation with somebody who already thinks they know what you're going to say. It's difficult. So, so uh, Jesus just is always trying to keep that from happening. So you hear, he does miracles, he helps people, and he tells people, don't share this. Which seems weird, but Jesus is constantly throughout his ministry fighting against this idea that he's going to destroy everybody who's not on his side. And you see that with him working with his disciples as well. He's constantly having to help them realize that I'm not coming to make sure that our enemies die. You read this, um, Jesus talks about this multiple times, starting in Matthew 20, verse 25, he says, And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and, he, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is fighting against this idea that he's going to 
come, he's going to rise up, let himself be anointed king, and then force everybody to do what he says. Um, so he's helping his disciples here. If you want to be like me, you're going to have to go in low. My kingdom expands by serving. And if you think you're really good, if you think that God has really blessed you and you're really strong and powerful, then you're going to need to serve even more. Then, uh, in Luke 9, 51, it says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, now this is kind of a way of saying when Jesus was almost ready to be made king. So he's been, he's been sent as king, he's been anointed by God, but it's not until his death and resurrection that he actually becomes king. This is the same way for David. David was anointed king by Samuel uh, while he was still young, and then over the course of years, he goes through these things, and then when he's 30, he's anointed to be, he then becomes king, even though God had anointed him a number of years before. It's the same way with Jesus. Jesus comes, he is the new king, but he doesn't actually become king and defeat sin until he dies and then he's resurrected. And so this is letting us know that as that time was approaching, so his disciples are following him and he knows and they know that he's about to become king. But they don't know exactly how this is going to happen, even though he's tried telling them. So he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for Jesus. But the Samaritans did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? So basically, we know you're about to become king. These people are not honoring you. They're not recognizing you as the right king. Why don't we destroy them um, to make way? And Jesus responds by this. But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. So there's this weird thing taking place where Jesus is coming, he's the new king, but he doesn't come and, de- and defeat the old kingdom by killing people. He comes, he says here, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And I believe that's how the angel can announce that Jesus is coming and he's going to be king and it's good news for everybody. Because he doesn't come to his enemies, the people that don't like him, the people that don't want them, and force them to follow him. He doesn't come and say, well, I'm king now. You need to do what I say. If you don't, I'm going to destroy you. That's what the disciples expected him to say. That's what they thought he was going to do. And he has to keep on telling them it's happening through a different way. Now, one of Adventism's founders, Ellen White, talks about this passage, and I love how she describes it. It's in Desire of Ages. Ellen White says that it is no part of Christ's mission to compel men to receive him. It is Satan and men actuated by his spirit that seek to compel the conscience. Under a pretense of zeal for righteousness, men who are allied with evil angels bring suffering upon their fellow men in order to convert them to their ideas of religion. So it's, she's kind of saying that there are lots of people who try to force people to follow God the way I'm following God. You know, my religion is right, I'm in the right path, and so you need to come and be like me and follow God like I'm following God. And she says this doesn't come from God, but actually from the enemy. Because she says that Christ is ever showing mercy, ever seeking to win by the revealing of his love. So not trying to win by having uh, more power, more force, but trying to win by his love being revealed. 
Jesus can admit no rival in the soul, nor accept partial service, but he desires only voluntary service, the willing surrender of the heart under the constraint of love. And it goes on to say, there can be no more conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of Satan than the disposition to hurt and destroy those who do not appreciate our work or who act contrary to our ideas. And so there's this idea that as people after Jesus, there's going to be a temptation to act like other people. To say, we're right and we're going to force you to do like we, like we think. Uh, to come to people and say, I know what's best, you should do this, you should do this, and I'm going to try to compel you and force you to do those right things. And when people don't appreciate that, and when people act against that, act against what we think should be best, there's going to be a temptation to try to hurt them or destroy them or their reputations. But it's interesting that Jesus is painting this picture that he's a king who comes and expands his kingdom, not by forcing people to do what he says, not by destroying people who are against him, but actually by love and eventually by giving himself for them. So Jesus has this option. You know the the song, um, he could have summoned 10,000 angels. He could have forced people to bow down to him. He could have forced people to do what is right. But instead, he took this other option of loving self-sacrifice. Paul describes it in Ephesians 2 like this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Jesus is coming as a king, and this is what the angels are announcing. He's coming as a king, but he's not going to expand his kingdom by force. He chooses instead to serve, to love his enemies, and eventually to give himself for the people who are currently against him. And I would say that... uh, It's because God's trying to get across this idea that his family is bigger than we think. That God wants sons and daughters who are not currently wanting to be part of his family. You see this, uh, Paul goes on to explain this in Ephesians 2.17. He says then, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So, you used to be on the outside, but now because of God, you're on the inside. Because God's family is bigger than just the Israelites. It's bigger than just the Israelites who are being faithful, like the Pharisees thought. And it's bigger than just the people that are currently wanting to follow God. And it's easy to spiritualize this and say that's really easy. But in fact, I think it's one of the hardest things about being a Christian, is that we combat, we fight against people that are against us, situations that are against us, through love and through sacrifice, instead of through force. So there's going to be temptations to force people to do what you want. And as a Christian, instead we love those enemies, we serve them, we work with them. One of my, uh, I'm going to share with you my, my favorite testimony of all time to close this today. To so talk about how this, this happens. Um, and as I'm sharing it, I want you to think about how... Um, how, you, how you're being called to apply this. The fact that Jesus um, came as a king to serve and not to force people to follow him. How are you called to then live in that way um, to, for the here and now? 
Because I think that there's still um, plenty of temptation to think that God is going to act only through these ways. You know, it's easy to look down on the Jews of thinking, oh, oh, why didn't they know what Jesus was about? They didn't know what Jesus was about because it was crazy. This idea that you can start a kingdom, that everything can be made right by sacrifice, by loving your enemies, that seems like it has no chance of working. And I think even now, it's tempting for Christians to just put their trust in one of here. Either God is going to bless our armies, and we're going to destroy our enemies. That's how God's purposes are going to come to be. Or um, God is just going to, he's going to come, and he's just going to destroy everybody who's against us. So all we need to do now is just hold out. You know, we're, we're going to be the people of God, um, and we're going to uh, pray that we survive these bad things, this bad time we're in, and then God's going to come and destroy everybody else. Or, we need to get ready, and once we're ready, then God is going to destroy everyone else. In the same way that the Jews thought these same things. But I believe that Jesus is looking for a people who don't just stand by and wait for God to come and everybody who hasn't accepted him to be destroyed. But he's wanting us to see um, events, see places where God's will needs to be done, and to come in and change those things through love, through forgiveness, through service. He doesn't want us just to like hang out and hope things get better, or just, man, things are getting really bad because of these things, and just watch them get bad. It's easy to say, oh, things are bad, so they're going to get worse, because that's a natural, that's a natural way of things. But I think God's inviting us to come in and to be his followers in such a way that we change people's lives, we change situations through love, service, and forgiveness to the people who are against us. So, Today, uh, I want to have you think about one of two applications. Uh, first, how does Jesus being king speak to your current situation? Whatever you're facing, whatever is stressing you out right now, making you worry, how does Jesus currently being king, he's currently in charge, how does that speak to your current situation? And then second, are you good news to those you disagree with? Yeah. Jesus says that his message, him being king, him being in charge, is good news for everybody. For the way you're living, are you good news to people who disagree with you and don't like you? Yeah. Or, uh, and, and if you don't know who you disagree and don't like, ask your kids. <laughs> <laughs> who, who don't I like? Oh, well, you don't like this person. Or every time this politician comes on TV, you say something, you know. Are you good news? <laughs> Is your life, the way you conduct yourself, good news to people who don't like you or who disagree with you? Now, I wrote down uh, some of these uh, details to get it right because it's my favorite testimony of all time. I heard it in 2005 from my friend Justin, who met this man. Um, it happened a couple of years earlier, September 23, 2003. Um, it happened down in Mozambique, Africa. Um, they were having this, uh, I think it was like a, a night worship session. So I think it was like a Friday night. Everybody was getting together, praying, worshiping together. And this guy named Francis was about ready to close up. He's going to lock the gates. And so he, he, was, he was the head greeter. He was the Perry Rogers of this congregation, okay? So he's out there. He's like, okay, it's getting kind of late. I'm going to go out and lock the doors. So he goes out to lock them, and he sees four guys. And he says, oh, you can come in, because he thinks that they just want to have fellowship. They just want to come in and worship with them. Then he asked, then they came in and kind of forced him uh, and, and pushed him and started beating him. And he asked them, what's happening? And they said, today is your last day. We are going to kill you. 
they uh, beat him, killed him, and then ran off. And this happened about 11 p.m. So the church just stops everything. They find out he's died. Um, he's taken to the hospital, but he doesn't make it. And so the church is just like, oh, what are we going to do? How, God, we know this isn't your will. And so the church begins praying, God, please, please work in this situation. Please uh, bring him back to life. Have your will done. We, we don't know what to do, but we know that you can make things right. So about an hour later at 1215, uh, Francis starts breathing again. He's brought back to life. And so then later, on the next day, the police come, and they have found one of the guys who did this. Now, uh, in America, we take it for granted the police are actually going to do their job and find people who do things bad. <laughs> but in other countries, this isn't always the case. So this is kind of a big deal, because they don't usually catch the people. Uh, so they actually catch one of the guys, and they bring him to the church, and say, will you please identify this guy and press charges? But right before um, Francis had gone to sleep the night before, um, he, was, like, he, he was alive, but he was messed up. Like, just, he was bruised, um, like really hurting. Um, at one point, uh, he, even, he said later that he even felt like he wanted to die because he was hurting so much. Um, so they had him at the hospital, but he was able to tell somebody from the church, uh, I forgive him. Don't, he said, um, just forgive them. And then he went to sleep. And so the church wanted to honor Francis' decision. And so the police came to them and they said, um, you know, no, he has forgiven them, and so we're not going to press charges. And at this point, the police are really upset because <laughs> they, they went to all this work, they found the right guy, and the church is wanting to forgive him. What a bunch of jerks. <laughs> and so, so they're trying to convince him, uh, and, but the church says, no, uh, we, we're, we're not going to press charges. He has told us that he forgives them, and so we have decided to forgive them too. And so the police are upset, but they leave. Then the people at the church get a call that Francis' whole body has been restored. He, he's not in any pain anymore, and they're discharging him because they have no reason to keep him overnight. And it's just like this crazy thing that happens. And so the next day, Francis, who has just, you know, been dead for a while, now alive, now like back to normal, he goes to the prison to get the guy out of jail who killed him. And he says, brother, uh, you don't know what you did. So he hugged him and said, would you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And the guy does. So he gets him out of jail, takes him home, this guy who killed him eventually goes to Bible school and becomes a pastor. And now he's a pastor in Mozambique. And my friend Justin, who was there for a year as a student missionary, um, said he, he met um, this guy Francis and talked with him about it uh, through an interpreter. But it's this thing where I think that's what God wants to do. He wants to take people that are doing wrong, that are acting totally against what he wants to have happen, and he wants us to act in such a way of love, forgiveness, and faith that the people who used to be enemies of God end up becoming part of God's kingdom. And, and I think this is why the Christian life is so difficult. It's because it's hard to believe and have faith that's actually going to happen. It's easy to think, you know what, if I just get a bigger gun, then I can help these people learn. <laughs> You know, if I can just um, convince them, if I can just force them to believe or act in this certain way, then things will be better. But Jesus is calling us to act like our king, to forgive, to love, and to expand God's kingdom by this, by this service, and eventually, um, you know, giving up our rights or laying down our lives. So I'm just going to pray for us now um, that God would help us have faith that this can actually be the way of expanding his kingdom. Because um, like the disciples before us and the Jews, it's easy to think that that's impossible and it's never going to work. But as we've seen, um, 
it actually is working. There are more Christians today than the rest of history combined. And God's wanting to expand his kingdom by us acting like our king. Let's pray. Jesus, it's, it's so tempting um, to just be discouraged and sad and say, look what the world has come to. But Jesus, I thank you that you invite us to join you in proclaiming this good news of look who has come into the world. Jesus, we thank you for choosing to come and be with us. That's what we celebrate for this Christmas. And God, we thank you too that you come as a king and that you bring your kingdom in such a way that it expands through love. That enemies become part of the family of God. And so Lord, I pray that though the time is short, that you would give us the faith, um, the endurance, the strength to continue loving and changing the world around us. Holy Spirit, help us to know what to do and how to do it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I want to leave you today with the words of the angel uh, announcing to the shepherds. And the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Church, may we live the love of Jesus in the service of our King this week. Thank you.